Welcome to Conversations in the Future of Work, a talk show where we welcome on thought leaders, trainers, facilitators, executives, and scientists who are all leaning in to the future of work. Today on the show, we will be discussing the next generation of coaching, and we have none other than the incredible Jay Harris with us. So Jay, I'd love to pass it on to you and just tell the audience who you are and, and what parts of your amazing history are most relevant. Of course. Well, one, thank you for having me, Rachel. And again, I do go by Jay. Um, I'm currently a vice president of solution strategy at an awesome professional development company by the name of Ariel. And my role within that company is one, as an executive coach and a facilitator, I actually facilitate and instruct a lot of the uh, cohort based as well as the one to one training that we do. But I also manage the facilitators and the coaches, um, the presence coaches within our community and within our facilitator and coach pool at Ariel. And I am just thrilled about this type of work. I'm thrilled about the work that you do. So I am just excited to jump in and again, thank you for having me. Awesome. So we're going to get started with our first question, just to dive right in, right? Given your fingers are really on the pulse of the, the next generation, the future of coaching, right? This has been such a disrupted space, mm -hmm. as have many of our professional spaces in the past few years. Mm -hmm. So what are some of the most disruptive changes you've noticed in the coaching industry specifically? I would say that's a really good question. Um, I would say that the disruptive change within the coach world and the coaching industry is really a response to the disruptive change that's happening in the world and thus the workplace itself. So, for instance, a couple of things that come to mind for me, um, you know, the first thing that comes top of mind for me is generational diversity. So this is something that I'm hearing over and over again from leaders, from the C-suite team, from people who are trying to figure out the best way to connect with their organization, with their teams, is um, how do we address generational diversity? It's certainly a disruptor where there are, at this time, five generations at work, uh, from traditionalists to uh, baby boomers, Gen X, millennials, Gen Z. And they all come with their own specific communication style, their own um, critical thinking skills that are derived from, one, their own lived experiences, but also just the world that they've all come up in and what has been their norm. So when you have all of these people essentially in this one ecosystem, how do you communicate and how do you uh, lead and coach them all? Because one size does not fit all. So that's been a huge disruptor within the industry, the workplace itself, thus as a coach, coming up with a strategy and a way to help leaders to be able to address that, uh, that challenge or that new opportunity, I like to say, is something that's disruptive in our industry. The second thing that I, that I like to mention that is a disruptor, but it's good, um, you know, because now people are catching on to, and I like to say it's the secret sauce that coaching is not just for uh, because something's wrong or you're mm -hmm. doing something bad, but people are now catching on to the idea of, you know, coaching is simply an opportunity for me to continue to grow, continue to uh, develop and improve and to be a bit more strategic about the path that I actually want to take as a professional within my field. Thus, the disruptive part on the coaching side is a lot of the coaches, and we'll talk a little bit a little bit about this later. But a lot of the coaches that are in the current um, our current roster, I should say, right now, they're already top performers. Mm -hmm. So, as a coach, how do you coach someone who is already doing so great? And so, it's 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 pushing the coaches to think in a bit more uh, innovative and out of the box way, if you will. Mm. Those mm -hmm. are two great points. I feel on the subject of uh, generational diversity, I think that's a real blind spot. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's something that I, I myself will sometimes catch myself like forgetting that right. we do have this insane span across generations and their experiences, especially today are so right. different, right? right? You have these yeah. digital natives Mm -hmm. on one hand, mm -hmm. who are very casual right. with technology. And right. then you have people who have evolved alongside the evolution of technology. But, you know, recently it's just gone haywire. Exactly. Um, exactly. 
So that's, no. that's fascinating. Yeah, it is. And it's something, again, it's one of the reasons why I mentioned it first is because um, as leaders are now being, honestly, it's the generational diversity that's, that is influencing the direction of the workplace in itself. Hmm. As I mentioned, each generation has its own set of lived experiences, its own set of, um, you know, social climates that they've, you know, come through and survived, uh, but have also been conditioned to. Hmm. For instance, when millennials entered the workforce, there was this massive shift in the workplace that brought that actually changed the trajectory of what used to be the American dream um, when it comes to a work a workplace or or a job, uh, meaning that the the historical definition of the American dream job is just to make a good livable wage, just to have you know decent benefits to be able to so, you know provide for your family and get your kids through college. And then I like to say, you know, get old enough to retire and, you know, get you a, a, a retired a house in Florida, you know, for, <laughs> yeah. for the rest of your, you know, your time. But that has drastically changed in it. And it most recently changed when millennials entered the workforce where now people, what they consider to be the American dream or um, a good job is more about a sense of belonging. Mm. It's more so about being connected to a bigger purpose or a, a bigger goal beyond themselves. But also, are they growing as an individual? Like, am I not only just growing within the organization, but am I becoming a better professional? Am I growing? What's in it for me? Um, of course, pay is always in there, but it's more so now as it pertains to retention and what people consider a good job. It's, do I feel that I belong here? Am I connected to this in a way that's outside of just, I'm an employee and you're my employer? Right. And it, it that both raises the bar on expectation in terms oh. of like that, that relationship between employer and employee. And then also to your other, to your second point, mm -hmm. introduces a really nice opportunity for that ongoing kind of coaching self-development journey. Exactly, exactly, yeah. exactly. Mm -hmm. that's, nice. that's absolutely true. Uh, and so touching a little further on this idea of, of how drastically different the coaching space has become in your capacity, of preparing and working with facilitators and coaches, like what, what are some of the ways that you think coaches can best prepare to meet this, this evolving space? Mm -hmm. Another good question. And, you know, it's, it's one, I smile about this because I recently had a conversation with another um, coach that's a part of our team. And, you know, it's interesting when you look at this term drastically evolved workplace, you know, a evolution is relative to where you start. So everyone has a different starting point. So evolution is different for all organizations. And so that's the first thing that I tell coaches when they come to me and they say, you know, this is a, um, an organization that really evolved or really progressive. And I say, OK, what is their definition of evolution? What is their definition of progressiveness? Because again, it is relative to where they were before, which may be further along than the next person or behind, um, you know, not as advanced as maybe someone else or another organization. So that's the first thing that I like to tell coaches to do is to take a look at what does the, the cultural infrastructure look like for that for that organization. And when we think about Evolved, I like to look at a few key areas from uh, technology. Is it is it is that their technology is evolved? Is it their platforms and systems evolved? Is it mm -hmm. the work environment in itself, you know, evolved? What does that look like? Is it different or is it lagging? Is one, you know, more progressive than the other? I say, take a look at the grand scheme of evolution within the company and look within those key areas, such as technology, such as culture, such as literally the physical modality in itself. Are they all remote? Is it a hybrid company? Are they, you know, all in a um, an open space workplace? Are they in offices? Really think about all the areas in which a um, a company can evolve those key areas such as technology, culture, and physical location. That's number one. And then I also say, you know, uh, do an assessment on, you know, how do people feel about 
their sense of belonging at work. So, you know, if they feel that this is a company that really fosters, you know, diversity or really fosters, um, you know, growth as an individual, I challenge the coach to think about one, what questions are you going to ask to do a deeper dive for what for an organization or a company that's already doing well, so to speak, that's going to be able to challenge them um, mm -hmm. in a way that feels like they're actually getting something from the coaching in itself. So right. I really say take a look at take a look at those two things first. What type of evolution is there, and then what types of from that from that assessment of what the evolution is, what type of questions and what areas do you see? that you can lean into to provide some type of benefit for the coachee. Right, and I would imagine that that does two things, right? That number one can help touch on their identities around mm -hmm. where they sit within a marketplace exactly. or uh, marketplace dynamics. Like we view ourselves as particularly evolved Right. Why? Because of these things, right? That's mm -hmm. an important identity to almost honor as a coach, mm -hmm. but then it also provides you with that rubric of, okay, and then how do we get, how do we unlock that yeah, next level, which is almost true. like that desired next yeah. self. Yeah, right? exactly. Because the, you know, the basis of coaching, and I'm sure we'll tap into this some more too, because it's such a, it's such a foundational part of coaching in that it's about, it's not about telling them what to do. It's not about, you know, in imposing your own ideas or your own personality traits and in, in, in critical thinking on someone else. But it's about asking the right questions to help them come to the best um, conclusions or the best strategy for their specific work environment, their specific challenges, their specific lived experiences. And I say specific lived experiences because I think sometimes with coaching, um, or, or in even in, in man, just managing overall, sometimes we forget, um, and this is a part of the evolution, that everyone is coming with their own lived experiences. Mm -hmm. if something, if you've lived through something traumatic or even something that's awesome in your life, whatever that is that you've lived through as a person, um, your lived experiences, it doesn't go away because you showed up to work. It's still with you. And I think that if you ignore that, and if you don't, you know, provide a space to acknowledge it and figure out how it has shaped a person's mental models, as we like to call them, an aerial, mm -hmm. you are missing out on a huge coaching opportunity and thus missing out on an opportunity for growth um, and, and advancement by tapping into that self-awareness. So it is, again, an opportunity for assessing and acknowledging identity differences. Um, and again, as you mentioned, where people sit within the organization, mm -hmm. but also where they sit within themselves as it pertains to the way that they think. Right. Mm -hmm. And this actually, you know, I think this brings us to our next question, which is, you know, what are some specific skills coaches and trainers need to have to be able to unlock some of what's changed over the last few years specifically, some of these changes you've just referenced? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love this question because it's super connected to who I am as a person, like my own purpose and values and 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 morals and, and my own belief system, you know, to a sense. And the reason I say that is, as I mentioned, you know, a few seconds ago, is that for a lot of people, it gets uncomfortable to think about when you talk about your lived experiences or your personal thoughts or your personal, um, just, just who you are as a human being is, is what I will say for so long. And this again, ties back even to generational diversity. Historically, it's when I show up at work, I am Jay Harris and I thank you for having me today, Rachel. And I am just in my zone, yeah. you know, I can't be any, you know, anything that I am outside of work. I can't bring that to work. Historically, that's what it's been. You yeah. know, you, you leave your, your home self at home and you, you bring your work self um, to work. But now as just the climate is evolving and people are understanding the importance of being a top performer is one, being able to be authentically yourself and being able to add your own specific, you know, touch to something. I tell people all the time, 
Plenty of people do the things that we do, but it's us being able to show up as ourselves, you know, genuinely and authentically that adds that variety, something that you you can, no one else has your tone, no one else has your mind, no one else has your personality, no one else has um, your ability to connect in the way that you connect. And that is what separates you. So I actually encourage hmm. you know, our coaches to lean into the individuality of the coachee. With that, that means that the number one skill you need is, or I say the top two skills you would need are empathy. And you also need to come in with an open mind because just because you have to remember that even you as the coach, that the, even you as the coach, you may not even have the same lived experience as the coachee. So mm -hmm. you challenge yourself to not go into bias thinking, don't go into it thinking, well, an idea, but this is what I would say. This is what I would do. No, I say lived in that, you know, live in that um, ambiguity of, okay, I'm, I'm interested in hearing more about, you know, why you would, why you would handle that, that situation that way, or why you would approach it that way. Mm -hmm. So with empathy, you're able to tap into those personal thought processes. You're able to tap into the authenticity of the individual that you're coaching ultimately you're allowing them to be themselves and you're creating that psychological safety that one needs in a coaching environment in order to try on new things you're challenging them to you're disrupting their thought pattern and so you know that comes with you need to show up with empathy and you need to create a space where the coachee feels comfortable to do that right there's something i remember from my training with ariel that has stuck with me over the years which is your coaches will only go so far or so exactly. big as, as you, you go. Right. Exactly. So, exactly. You, know. you know, that's a funny thing that you mentioned that because that is something that we talk about at Ariel and um, I carry that same sentiment. I will tell you, Rachel, I, because I love this work so much mm -hmm. and we talked about this a little bit, you know, in, in our passing conversations, I'm so passionate about this work that when I get into these spaces, I always tell myself, okay, Jay, Try to manage your excitement, but I'm literally <laughs> about to explode with glee because I'm like, this is, I love this work. Right? Yeah. But when I show up to coaching sessions one to one, and when I show up into cohort based settings where it's a group of people that I'm facilitating for, I manage it, but I don't hide it. Because yeah. when people can see that I'm showing up authentically as myself, as you mentioned, it licensed them to lean into who they really are, to speak in the language that they speak um, and to operate, you know, the way that they do. And you're right. It's like what, if I show up here, you know, the the coachee or the cohort, they're going to reach just about here. Yes. You know, so they're never going to. It's like I'll go as far, I'll go as far as I can. So if you as the the one that's coaching or leading the room can you know go big and be authentic to who you are, it's not so much that it's performative, but just being genuine. Um, then your your coaches and your your cohort, your group of of trainees are more likely to to try to meet you there. Totally, I think that is such a critical takeaway for anyone, whether you're a coach, whether you're a leader, manager, right? Like you, you're setting the bar yeah. and, uh, you know, the higher you set it, the higher everyone else will reach. Exactly. So, exactly. Exactly. Wonderful. Yeah. Um, so let's, let's switch tracks a little bit for this last question mm -hmm. and talk about some AI and tech within this coaching space, right? So historically coaching has always been like strictly human to human in the same room. Right. That has completely changed, yeah. you know, now. And now we have tools like Virtual Sapiens, which can help right. with self-paced and continued improvement. But there's also a whole bunch of other stuff going on. So yeah. curious to see your opinion on how this kind of technology can enhance. Yeah. And then also, like, what are some of your fears around this? That's a really, really good question in the sense of it's it's what's happening in real time. You know, um, one tech will always continue to evolve. It'll always continue to be immersed and woven into our daily lives, but of course, into our professional lives. And I'll be honest with you as a millennial and just as someone who studied this work in, in such deep capacity on so many different realms, um, and the reason why I mentioned I'm a millennial is that I grew up in the, in the um, 
you know, the initiation of technology, if you will. Yeah. And so I have come into this industry with a sense of it's going to always continue to grow and it's always going to be here. Well, in the realm of coaching, it's so fascinating to me because in the realm of, of, of uh, technology in itself, you now have platforms that you can leverage that kind of take out some of the manual labor of the coaching aspect. And that part of it, what I mean is not replacing the expertise or not you know, replacing what the coach has to offer in terms of their own research and their own um, experience, but in terms of like assessments in terms of 360 uh, feedback. It's no longer, the coach no longer has to chase down, you know, all these different individuals to get this right. feedback. There's now technology that supports being able to curate the questions and the exact type of feedback that the coachee wants to receive from those who will contribute and be able to disperse that out to, you know, the individuals or the stakeholders that are involved. And then when you receive that information back, it's already formulated to have um, acknowledged or accessed the areas that, you know, came up more than once, you know, so there, there are common themes, things of that nature, particularly with virtual sapiens. I can't tell you how much I have um, use the virtual presence assessment. And I will say that I even used it for myself. And I'll be honest, I came into it thinking, oh, I'm, I'm already, I'm already an expert. You know, <laughs> I know this. To my surprise, there were things that AI was able to catch for me in, in, in just a solo setting using that virtual presence assessment that brought pause to me and awareness, I should say, where now I'm much more cognizant and much more um, thoughtful about my overall presentation in the virtual environment. Mm -hmm. Honestly, it translates into an in-person environment. So I would say all in all, I believe that tech and AI is um, a system of tools that we're able to leverage to get those results quicker. We're able to get, honestly, a more, um, a more accurate amount of data to think about. You can formulate, you know, metrics that think about things, um, you know, all at once. You know, I can tell you in coaching, sometimes I'm like, okay, I'm focusing for eye contact. Do they have eye yeah. contact? Oh, wait, yeah. I forgot to look at facial expression. You know, so it's like when you have that AI tool and that tech assessment, it's able to do the thinking for you. And I think we should leverage that. When it comes to detracting yeah. or, or fears that I might have, um, I won't say that it's a fear or even that it's a detraction. It's more so of the investment of getting the buy-in to get people on board it may take a little bit more um, effort than normal, especially when it's new to you in the realm of coaching. But I can tell you from my own experience and speaking with other coaches, once you get the buy-in of saying, well, hey, this is a coaching opportunity. We're just trying things on. Once they try it on, they never want to take it off. Okay. And so I can say that the um, the obstacle, if you will, is just getting the buy-in. But once you've got it, mm -hmm. you certainly have it. And it's it's definitely you're en route to um, improvement and seeing some metrics and feedback that you might otherwise would not have gotten. Right. Yeah. No, I, I mean, I love that. And I, I do agree. I think that there's an ability to leverage AI and technology right. for things that require almost like a multi, I don't want to say multitasking, but like this like ability yeah. to be able to give feedback on 20 yeah. different behaviors all at once. And what is the full picture and impression of that? Right. Exactly. So exactly. That and like, so, like, as you said, just taking some of the burden of like automating some things that are typically manual and painstaking out of the hands of the coaches so that the right. coaches can focus on what they do best. Right, right. And, and I love that you mentioned that so that the coaches can focus on what they do best. Yeah. Because when you, it, we're human beings, as great and awesome as we you know, are, we are human beings. And, and sometimes we only can think about one thing at a time. Most of the time, if we want efficacy, we can only think about one thing at a time. And so when you have a platform and a system that pulls it all together for you, it does enable the coach to spend more time in the areas of expertise and those niche you know, specifics and, and, and um, goals that the coach he has. And you can spend more time on strategy because yeah. you have the information at your fingertips. Totally. Mm -hmm. Totally. Love that. Yeah. Love that. Love all of this. So Jay, we're, we're at time and I could just keep 
talking to you about all this Maybe. stuff. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. Before we log off, uh, anything else you'd like to share with our audience? How can they connect with you directly if that's of interest? Yeah, of course, of course. Well, the one thing that I, you know, would like to leave the audience with, and this is something that I always say, even from my coaching approach, is um, leading with that 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 skill of empathy. My challenge to your viewers and listeners and people that you know have to lead other people or just human connection is to really think about: Am I creating a space in which others are able to connect with me in an authentic way? Mm -hmm. And thus be able to drive some type of inspired result, whether that's with your clients, whether that's with your colleagues or a friend or even your direct report. Am I actually investing in those opportunities of connection um, at the best of my ability via empathy? In terms of being able to find me, of course, on LinkedIn, uh, Javaris Harris, as you see um, in the lower third of the screen. Um, and so I just I just implore you all to continue to explore this um, this realm of coaching and, and being a top performer. And um, you'll see me around. And, and, and uh, I look forward to more opportunities like this with you, Rachel, where we can continue to have this conversation. Awesome. Well, thank you again for, for joining us and for sharing your amazing insights. And thank you to everyone for listening. Until next time. Awesome. <laughs>